Um, Jeff is um, with the Bridge Span office in Boston, and Bridge Span is a nonprofit advisor and resource for mission driven organizations and philanthropists. He's currently a manager there and has been there since 2005. Um, prior to Bridge Span, he was with two years with the Monitor Group, working with Fortune 500 com companies in energy, transportation, and healthcare. He also worked with the Urban Institute for Metropolitan Housing and Community College Center. And I'm excited for him to talk a little bit with you about, of course, his career path. How many of you have heard me that for? <laughs> um, and for you to get a sense of kind of how he got where he is today. Um, Jeff has worked in developing worlds, including um, the developing world, including Chile, Guatemala, and the Philippines. He got his BA here in economics, and he got his MP from the Harvard Kennedy School. So please welcome Jeff.
I would do in law, especially in the first year, which is very different. And I, I hated it. And so I dropped out of law school. So I got a couple of big fails here very early in my career, right? So just take note of that. Uh, I dropped out of law school, which is a really bad financial decision. I don't recommend it. You should probably stick it out and get a job. You know what I'm saying? Um, but from a sort of a personal point of view, it made a lot of sense because it was not what I wanted to do. I cared more about this question of well-being. And typically, most law jobs are about how do you get what's best for a client? It's about the narrow partisan victory rather than what's best for the whole. So I quit law school. And this, this is where it starts getting nitty gritty and it has to stay with the tenor. I couch surfed in DC. You know, there are a lot of BYU folks in DC. I couch surfed in DC for several months. This is the point at which I met my wife. She did not date me at that point because I was couch surfing. I was a temp receptionist at a call center for Sprint in her Virginia. So in terms of sort of prestige, this was sort of a low point in my career. Um, <laughs> but it was paying bills. And this is where I met my wife, which is a good thing, right? From there, I actually worked my way up. So I was a temp receptionist. And at one point, they brought me some data and said, look, our, our analyst just got canned. We have this data, you seem smart, and you studied economics, could you make us a two by two plot? It was the call time, like how long people took on the phone, and satisfaction of the people that, that interacted with them on the phone. Right? So we wanted to just plot all the people in that call center. So I said, sure. I made this scatter plot graph. Like, wow, that was fast. It took our old guy three days. And I did it in like an hour or something. So he said, how would you like to move back away from being a receptionist to the analyst spot, just temporarily? I said, sure, but I'm only looking for like, a policy job or something like that, something that makes use of my economics. I'm like, just don't worry, just, you know, just do it part of your temp thing, right? And I said, well, if I'm going to do that, you probably have to pay me more. And mm -hmm. So they talked about the pay. By the end of a couple of months, they wanted me to stay on full time. I was networking for other jobs at the time. And so I had networked into this job at the Urban Institute. Has anyone heard of the Urban Institute? It's, no, it's kind of a policy think tank. Um, happens my dad's best friend at work had a brother who was working at the Urban Institute. And so he got me an informational interview. I walked in. This nice guy with a ponytail said, yeah, I'm looking for an analyst. That'd be cool. Come work for me. So I had a, an offer for 30000 bucks at the Urban Institute. And what I told the other guy at, at the urging of, of my roommate was, I told him, I'll come work for you if you can get me 40000 bucks," which to me at the time was astronomical. I was like, I had this bird in the hand for 30000 I said, give me 40000 bucks. I will come and I will work as an analyst at this call center in Harmon, Virginia, you know, permanently. He went and he begged and he scraped and he got the 40,000 bucks. I didn't think he was going to get it. That's the only reason I said it. I just wanted to get an offer for him that was higher than the other one. So I could go back to them and say, oh, I have this other offer and you can give me a little more money. Anyway, he went and got the 40,000 bucks and I had to go turn him down and he was heartbroken. But that decision. What I was trying to do is, I said, I want to do something that makes use of my economic skills and it points me towards public policy and is roughly in the realm of answering this question about what is well-being. And a call center in Virginia, in Herndon, Virginia, you can give me a free cell phone, is really not going to do that. Um, so, note that. I think that was a good decision. From the Urban Institute, I learned how to run SAFs and STATA and do stats. I learned how to write in sort of a technical writing way, report writing. And that's, I didn't know at the time, but the Urban Institute is actually a really prestigious thing to have on your resume if you're a policy analyst. So with that, this is kind of the go-go early 2000s, I put my resume out on monster.com and had two offers within two days. I sort of decided I wanted to move into something more like consulting from there. And so I went to an advertising firm, right? So you, you can see the natural linear path here, right? <laughs> In a call center, think tank, advertising firm. The ad firm was doing permission-based marketing, lots of direct mail, interacting with people, and they needed someone to take all the massive data and make sense of it and figure out where should they invest more, what type of people were responding to their mailings, what type were not. So I did a bunch of SaaS, Stata, kind of statistics work for them for about a year. And then a friend of mine from BYU, who I respected a lot and was very bright and who I was good friends with, she had been working at this consulting firm called Monitor. Her boss was in New York and had asked her, look, you're moving on. She was going to move to London. He said, look, you're moving on. Who do you know who's like you? And so she said, well, I have this friend, Jeff. And so we met for lunch. She and her boss and I, and by the end of it, we made me an offer for a lot more money than I would have made in Herndon at the call center, by the way, um, to go to this consulting firm. Not as a consultant, but just to help him. And so her boss was the 
chief knowledge officer, which sounds a little pretentious, but what it means in a consulting firm is you work on the IP, the intellectual property, the frameworks that the consultants use to make their lives easier to add value for clients. So I wanted help developing these frameworks for a while. Eventually I transitioned over to being a consultant. So I didn't really actually interview for the, the job of consultant, I just kind of weaseled my way in the back door essentially. And so I, I ended up being a consultant for a couple of years and monitor a for-profit consulting firm. By this point, my wife decided she would date me. Before she wouldn't date me because I was a bum on her couch. And now she decided she would date me. So we got married. Um, and I really decided I needed to go back to graduate school. What actually happened is another good friend from BYU, one of the first class of MPA students actually, named Margaret Woolley, um, who was working at the Treasury and something, she kept haranguing me saying, you need to go back and get a master's degree. You need to do something. You're set up to do that. That's who you are. You care about policy. You should do it. So she kept prompting me. And so I finally applied to the Kennedy School and Princeton, and I think that was it. And I got waitlisted. I didn't make it. And I went and talked to the, the Dean of Admissions and said, I just want to understand like, what could I have done to make my application stronger. And he basically said, look, there's a lot of good stuff here. The only question is your last job was a for-profit job. And so we really don't want people coming in and going into pure for-profit jobs. So we just need to see a little more public service. So my wife and I, after we got married, I volunteered on Mitt Romney's campaign for a little bit for governor, and then went to the Philippines to run a charity, basically fundraising for a charity for six months with my wife. Reapplied, got into the Kennedy School. I had a good time at the Kennedy School. Coming out of the Kennedy School, the same friend, Margaret Willie, said, hey, you know, I worked for this place called Bridgespan. You should really think about it. You know, she, she and I had never sort of put that together before that it would make sense, but when you look at my kind of odd career path, what it has is for-profit consulting and policy analysis and statistics and some sort of charitable work. In. So the combination of those things actually fits really nicely into this box that was Bridgespan. Bridgespan takes for-profit tools and tries to apply them to social issues by consulting for philanthropy, nonprofits, uh, and NGOs. I got hired. I was actually going to do a foreign service track. I passed the written exam for foreign service. I was in for the presidential management internship as well. I was kind of underway doing some of that application. But then Bridgespan hired me, and I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. And I started in 2005, and it's been now eight years or so. So I guess the two things I would I would suggest you take away from that. Hello, McFarlane's. This is my sister and brother-in-law. <laughs> they don't understand what I do, so I told them they should come. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is a German professor at many of you were taking German. Very highly rated on rate my professor doctor. <laughs> I've taken it, it's pretty good. <laughs> two and a half stars. <laughs> these are the two things I would take away from that sort of funny, meandering career path. One is, there were friends at each point who I was in contact with, not because I wanted a job or wanted anything from them, but because I liked them. Right? So Susan Hamilton was a friend of mine from here. This friend of my father's at the Urban Institute, uh, Margaret Woolley, they were just friends because I trusted them, I liked them, and they were bright, and, and we got along well. And because I was in touch with them, they felt comfortable kind of connecting me along the way. So, you know, there's networking, which some of which you can do in sort of a cynical or a callous sense. That's not what this was. This was just having friends who I who I like and keeping in touch with them. And that turns out to have really guided my career in a sense. And the other is that when I had choices to make, I ultimately tried to pick things which stretched me a lot. So I was not particularly sure if I would be good enough at the Urban Institute, but I had this economics degree, and I had this guy who said he would hire me, so I did it. Frankly, it felt like, at the time, quite a big trade-off. Forty thousand bucks I could have made at the call center to thirty thousand bucks at this think tank. But I think those sorts of trade-offs, sticking to what's gonna stretch you the most, actually has, has been good for me over time. So let me let me stop there. Before I get into anything else, questions, comments, criticism about my life choices in general. <laughs> <laughs> Observations. Topic group. When you went to the Philippines, was it the parts of group that you went with or you just went on your own with your wife? No, so we did. We went with the group. So again, it was through my father-in-law had connections to several people who were involved in global development and NGOs. We sort of did informational interviews with a bunch of them and asked them, hey, we'll pay our own way. We'll kind of raise money from friends and family to do this and volunteer our time. Is there something meaningful we could do? And one of those popped in the Philippines. It was called, it was called 
this is called the Muhai Deseret, now it's called Deseret International, that they do cataracts for degrees, left lip, left foot, that kind of thing. But it was very intentional. Right? We wanted that type of experience. Yeah? Um, it seems like just six months. Does that is that good for an NGO to go work for, for just six months? <laughs> you said you managed, didn't you? What's that? You said you managed it, oh, so didn't you? So what's on my resume is country director. I did not direct anything. I was a fundraiser. Um, so the country director, in reality, was a woman named Grace Tay, and she stayed in she stayed in place. I needed the title to be able to raise the money. So we, what I really did was turbocharge their local fundraising for six months. We ran a benefit concert, and my wife and I basically produced this concert. It was not what we thought we were going to do, but that's what we did. And so in that sense, I think it was helpful. <coughs> what I think we got wrong about that experience is we didn't institutionalize that fundraising. We ran this concert, and I think we should, what we should have been doing is trying to figure out how do we make this replicable next year, set up all the relationships so they could do it again. As it turned out, we gave them this big cash infusion, and then the next year they couldn't quite cobble it together in the same way again, so it sort of fell off again. But um, that's a great question. Six months can be very helpful or very dangerous. <coughs> yeah. What was it like going from BYU to Harvard just the atmosphere there with public policy and maybe your own personal views, but then dealing with an environment that was probably different than what you experienced out here. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so I live in Boston now, I stayed, and I grew up in, in one of the more liberal parts of the country. <laughs> My sister and brother-in-law can attest on that. Um, but I, so I'm actually quite comfortable in that environment, being one of the few Mormons people know. And my politics are fairly centrist and pragmatic, so I feel like I can sort of speak both sides of that. There was a really great experience early on. So we were doing our kind of orientation at the Kennedy School, and they had us divide ourselves along three different dimensions. They had us in a big room, a ballroom, and they said, we want you all to self-group geographically by where you're from. And so you had these interesting groupings of people from California who didn't think of themselves as from the rest of the West. And then you got all the plain states together. And then even people from different parts of New Jersey were hiding themselves off because they didn't think of themselves as that kind of New Jersey. <laughs> That was really interesting. Then they did it by race. That was quite interesting because you had all this white guilt huddled in one corner of the room <laughs> and then a bunch of, of, of other folks of different shades of, of, of black and brown in other parts of the room. And it was very interesting to watch. And then they did it politically. And at the Kennedy School, what happened is 75% you know, of the people went off to some vaguely leftish democratic group and immediately started carving themselves up because they didn't agree with one another. <laughs> it's like it's like a nuclear atom where it gets unstable. <laughs> then there were a few largely active military folks who were Republicans and loud and proud about it. And then there were like 20 of us in the middle who said, I don't, that's not me. I don't care necessarily about the label, but I want results. I want evidence-based thinking. I want data-driven policy. And so we called ourselves the Independent Caucus and actually started a group called the Independent Caucus, which is now defunct. But we had a really good time trying to define what it meant to be Burning questions about my nasty career path? Okay, I'm happy to talk about this afterwards. Yeah. Sorry, just real quick. You did say it, it took a different route. Can you maybe just briefly share like <coughs> what your thought process process was? I mean, was that intimidating? Were you fearful going through that path, or did you just have full confidence that everything would work out? I mean, because because we probably, I mean, quite a few of us might have a path like that that goes. It's not going to go straight. It's going to go all over the place, but kind of emotionally in our mind, mentally, how do you handle that and what was it like for you to go through that and did you have complete trust and it was like, this will be great, I'll just go with it. Uh, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it, was not, it, it was not a clean path. Right? It's funny to have my sister, she saw me at sort of different points when this was not at all a happy transition for me. Right? <laughs> um, but I think what I would say is at any given point, I would be going down some track, like for instance at the Urban Institute, and get to a point where I felt like there was some sort of subconscious prompting, whatever you want to, however you want to think about that, that this is not <coughs> gelling with me anymore. And I've sort of ridden this train as far as I, I want to go. And so I probably should have paid more attention to those earlier on than I did. I think I, I sort of outstayed my, my own welcome in certain instances. But I think that's what I was trying to pay attention to was, 
is this still generally getting me to where I want to go? I think I had this vision of doing something which was both uh, prestigious and would pay me enough to live on. Some of that's just personal vanity, right? Um, but also was relevant to solving some of this question I've always had about well-being. I think that was sort of the low star for me. That's what I was trying to, to gear on. And so when I was at Europe Institute, it became a question, you know, this is really not fast-paced enough for me. I feel like I'm sort of being sucked into this academic pace of work that's not, doesn't feel right to me. Then at Monitor, I felt the opposite. Like, this is just way too hectic for me. I don't care enough about the issues to be investing so much of my life in it. And at some point, I started sort of hitting this mental block about going into work again. And you don't have to answer it now, but as you continue on talking to us, can you maybe express how you've worked in a lot of different industries, and we're learning about a lot of them, you know, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you've worked with a little bit in government, with policy, yeah. um, nonprofit. I mean, a lot of us have different emphasis, yeah. but can you maybe explain as you go through the rest of your presentation how they, um, or maybe, or if they don't, but how they might um, be complementary to one another, having that experience and understanding how they work? Yeah. That's a great point. I, uh, yeah. Let me go through this, and at the end, yeah. when we get to more questions, let's see if I, had, if I haven't answered that from the back up. Okay. I have a strong point of view about that. Yeah, I figured you might answer it, so. Okay. Uh, All right, so let me go. I'll go into my presentation. I'm going to do this a little bit as a choose your own adventure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I put a bunch of slides from three different presentations together, and I'm going to do what I call PowerPoint karaoke where we'll flip to the section you guys want to hear about, and then I'll try to remember what the slides are about as we go. The first section I actually thought about, though, this is what I wanted to convey, so four slides. So first off, who is this guy and what does he do? I'll give you 20 seconds to skim that. So we are a nonprofit. The Bridge Bay Group is a nonprofit entity. And um, we think of ourselves as advising the social sector, right? Who, who here has heard of Bain and Company or Bain Capital? Okay. So again, our friend Mitt Romney was tied up in, in that whole thing. The guy who ran Bain and Company, which is a, which is a for profit strategy consulting firm, after he was done being the head of that, he stepped down and founded First <coughs> Bain, which is an odd maneuver. But Mitt went on to found Bain Capital, which was fabulously successful as a private equity firm. My friend Tom Tierney stepped down to found a nonprofit. The whole idea, the metaphor here is you can bridge the intellectual property, the <coughs> skills, the business planning from the for-profit world into the non-profit world, and it would be helpful, right? We now have 200 employees, so that was in 2000, yeah, the year 2000. We now have 200 employees, three offices, Boston, San Francisco, and New York, and have worked with all the big foundations you might have heard of and a lot of the big innovative non-profits. So we do a lot with Gates, Rockefeller, Atlantic Philanthropies, Evan McCollum Clark, KIPP, Nurse Family Partnership, Aspire, and uh, anyway, long client list we talked about. That's, that's who we are and what we do. If that sounded like a bunch of gobbledygook, I wanted to explain a little bit more. Um, the way to think about it is this I'm a consultant, so within that group, there's several different pieces of what we do, but I'm in consulting. In consulting, we do the same thing that for profit consultants do, but we do it in these practice areas. So we do it in education, children, youth, and families. Which Think of that as out of school time and mentoring and things like that. Public health and global development, which is awful to call the rest of the world one little practice area, right? Because it's all the same things just outside of the US. But we, for right now, we have what we call global development, which is everything else. We do it, we have a particular set of expertise that we use. So strategy is kind of where we enter most of these, helping people get strategic clarity. Uh, but we also do performance measurement, which is extra important, which is why I put the second bullet there. Um, <laughs> leadership funding strategy, which is an interesting one. We do a lot with networks and affiliates, so Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, the network that holds them together, United Way, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, things like that. So I'm going to I'm gonna now uh, try to pop some bubbles. This is going to be a little bit of a downer, but here's, here's a story to start us off. Here's my hypothesis. I think philanthropies, foundations, and nonprofits generally don't do a very good job. They don't actually accomplish what they say they are trying to accomplish. I think most of them are probably pretty hard on themselves too, so it's not like I'm telling tales out of school, they know this, right? But they generally don't actually have the traction that they would like to have or that we as a society need them to have. Why?
Why is that? Well, let me start with a story. It's a man named Paul Schmitz, who I worked with on a, on a project a while back. He's the CEO of Public Allies, which is a nonprofit in Milwaukee. He said, we were talking about collaboration and some other things that relate to your question. And he said, look, we've been trying for 15 years now to take a program model and scale it up, to take an organization and make it bigger, and take the efficacy, the results, the success that we see at a small scale, and take it to the level of a city, or a state, or even a region, or, or a nation. And it's never happened. It's just never happened. Almost literally zero, like a goose egg. He said, every day I open up the newspaper, or I talk to some CEO of a nonprofit, and they tell me about their results, and their results are always good, they're always getting better, they're doing more and more for tougher and tougher kids, and yet when I open the paper and look at the dropout rate, or homelessness, or teen pregnancy, those are not moving. In fact, often they're going the wrong direction. So what is the disconnect between the results in an organization, in their program, and the city level, or state level, or national level indicator on that social issue, right? That's a serious disconnect. What, what is it? Why is it not, why are those not syncing up? You guys probably know this. And there's lots of reasons, right? But what is the breakdown between an organization with a good program model, a good intervention, getting good results, and the city level data not moving? Why does that happen? No. I think it's a lack of connection because oftentimes nonprofit organizations feel like they need more support than themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they lack a connection with the city. Mm -hmm. And so they never feel that connection and they never work on necessarily being more effective so that what they could scale up. They just focus on their small issue. Right. So they're, so they're fragmented, they're silent, <laughs> they're working on one particular element of something not connected with the local government systems or broader systems. Yeah. Probably not measuring particularly well. What else, Dan? Do That was essentially what I was going to say. They're focused so much on outputs instead of outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are all true. We could go into a lack of strong leadership and bench strength. We could go into a lack of funding for infrastructure and overhead. There's lots of things going on here. Uh, I'm supposed to be in a meeting. Um, here's what I think is going on. So, Philanthropies are prone to satisfactory underperformance. I love that. So this is the founder of our, of our firm, Tom Tierney. He will go into a philanthropy and say, this is why you guys suck. This is you suck. He says, this is why you're not getting what you want. You're, there's satisfactory underperformance. You're okay with turning in crap results every year. And this is why. First of all, there's no market force. Right? Your customers are not paying for the service. Right? Ultimately, the end beneficiary is not going to come and chew you out as a program officer of the Ford Foundation if they don't get results. There is no customer, essentially. The feedback you do get is largely sucking up, right? Because the feedback you're getting is from the nonprofits who need your money. And so they're gonna tell you how interesting your strategy is, how helpful your advice has been, how they would love to have you at the next board meeting. And none of that, frankly, is fairly clean, clear, honest, transparent feedback on how you're interacting with them, right? The social problems are very complex, right? We all know this, but building a widget or even making a car is actually a technical exercise. These are not technical exercises that we're trying to solve. Homelessness does not have a technical solution, at least not yet, right? We're getting closer. But many of these, we don't know the answer. We have to co-discover them with large groups of people that all have a say in the game, and it's very difficult to do. All philanthropy is fundamentally personal. If you are a crazy rich dude, and I would just say, most rich dudes are crazy. Right, the things that get you a billion dollars are not things that make you friends and win influence, typically. Right? I, I say this coming off a particularly bad project, so. Uh, <laughs> but the things that make you rich, and then the things that happen to you once you're rich, do not make you necessarily doubt yourself a whole lot. Right? So when you have a new idea or a new whim, you tend to do it. So every six months, you can get interested in a new topic, move your entire grant making somewhere else. And that's problematic. Right? What does that lead to? Superficial strategies, strategies which really aren't making the deep trade-offs we need to make. Chronic underinvestment, where you said, well, I'm interested in all these things because I have friends who have told me about all these things, so I'm going to give a million bucks to each one. And frankly, when it comes to what you're trying to do at a city level, a million bucks doesn't cut it. Right? The entire philanthropy sector is probably not enough to move the needle on what we're trying to move. Right? So, chronic underinvestment. Self-absorption, thinking what you're doing is cooler than it actually is, and wishful thinking. Oh, if we do this new thing, it's going to get picked up by government.
government, and it will all be great. Right? That is sort of the secret sauce that every philanthropist has in mind. And frankly, the number of times it actually has happened, again, is pretty close to zero, right? with results. It's very close to zero. So that leads to this kind of rhetoric versus reality gap. You will hear philanthropists talking about what they're working on, what their aspiration is, what they think they've accomplished, and that, relative to those city-level indicators or state or national-level indicators, it's hard to draw a line between what they're saying and the data out the other end. Now, I've been focusing on philanthropists because that's what I know best, but I think you could say the same thing for government agencies. I think you could say the same thing for high-net-worth individuals who don't have a foundation, per se, and even individual donors like us. Right? I think some of this happens as well. Right? So the funding flowing into the sector is fundamentally messed up. Right? The capital markets that you would have as a for-profit, the capital market in the for-profit sense gives money where it will make more money. When there's data, it will flow there and give you more money. Right? If there's data saying, hey, there's money to be made here, you'll get an investment, at least on average. Right? Here, the opposite happens. If you're really effective and do a good job over five years, they yank your funding because you've got more they expect the government to take you out by that. So that's a big problem. Where does that lead? For the nonprofits, it leads to the same set of problems around complex social problems, right? Still very difficult. You have multiple stakeholders. So if you're in a company, you have a customer, you serve them well, that creates money, and that keeps your board happy. Board and customer. You think of board as investors too, right? So fundamentally, it's not simple always, but it's pretty clear. Add to that the fact that now in a nonprofit you have a customer or a beneficiary or a participant that is different from the funder who's paying you to do it. So you automatically have that tension in what you're doing. The funder will say, we think you ought to do X. They may or may not have any data behind that or any skill or acumen to say that, but they will say it and you will respond because you pay your bills. At the same time, the constituents or, part or participants may say something different and you're left to kind of make a sense of it. You may have multiple funders, you may have philanthropy, you may have several government agencies, each of which have different requirements of you, and so you will morph into whatever you need to to keep those funders happy. And on top of that, you still have a board who have strong opinions and maybe funders as well at some level. So the number of stakeholders is a bit more complicated. This leads to exactly what you'd expect, the lack of strategic clarity, where you're willing to make yourself into an amoeba to go wherever a funder is willing to pay you as long as it's roughly within the realm of what you do. To make it into a joke, if someone were to come to the average nonprofit CEO and say, I'll give you a million bucks a year if you will start a heli skiing resort on the top of Mount Timpanogos, they would say yes. And they would find a way to describe that as benefiting low income immigrant kids <laughs> <laughs> living in Provo. But that is what they do. That is what grant writing is. It's trying to morph everything you do into the pattern of what the funder is asking for. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody, but that is what it is. Because of all that, it becomes very difficult to measure results. You may not even have agreement among your board and funders about what outcomes matter. They may be looking for different outcomes from you. Right? Add on top of that the fact that it's difficult to measure social issues. It's difficult to measure the progress of a kid who may later in life become incarcerated if you're trying to prevent from becoming incarcerated. How do you prevent something that, how do you measure something you want to prevent 20 years down the road? Very difficult. Right? Last, well, second to last. Overhead is vastly underfunded. So this is, how, how many of you have used Charity Navigator or GuideStar or one of those? How many of you have looked at the overhead rates? Right? How many, have you heard this whole spiel before? Okay, all right. We, we wrote an article on this called The Starvation Cycle. It's my strong belief that overhead rate means almost nothing about the effectiveness of a nonprofit, right? I have a client right now that is a $100 million nonprofit. $50 million of that is passed through funding, right? So they are taking that money from Gates and spending it, well, they're just passing it straight through to work on missiles programs. They're gonna lose that. When they lose that, the denominator will change and their overhead rate will double with absolutely no effect on the impact they are having on all the rest of their programs, right? But their overhead rate will just double. It's totally meaningless in terms of efficacy. And let me just one other point on this while I'm on it. I have a good friend, the only other LDS guy, a rich fan, who just wrote an article on the overhead of non -prof, of NGOs. He benchmarked them against four profits and he benchmarked them against one another. And what he found was fascinating. The finance cost tends to be very high, higher than you would expect in a for profit. The IT cost tends to be very low. And in fact, the finance cost increase outweighs the, the cheapness of the IT. 
And so they dug into this and said, what is going on? It turns out you can't get a funder to pay you for an upgrade to your IT system, your general ledger, general ledger system, your accounting system. So what you do is you throw more temps at it, you throw more accountants at it, and keep doing it in Excel. So rather than getting the cost savings from a good IT system, you spend more of your funder's money by adding people to the problem when you, because you can't get the money to automate it. Right? Because funders will not pay for something they sense is infrastructure or overhead. Right? And you can tell the same story about HR and training. You can tell the same story about measurement, which is something I'm particularly interested in. So there's this starvation cycle where the funders think overhead should be low. Then the nonprofits buy that. They start underfunding investment and misreporting it. Right? The director of finance is by definition an overhead position. And yet in almost every nonprofit, you will see them listed as being 50 to 80 percent direct program expense in order to keep that cost out of the overhead. Mm -hmm. Which is complete malarkey. Everybody knows it. The funders know it, the nonprofits know it, but no one is willing to kind of step back and unwind that because they get punished in the overhead. So anyway, sorry for that tirade. I clearly feel strong about it. <laughs> lastly is, and I said this before, impact at scale is very, very rare. So I know at a small level, at a demonstration level, how to cure almost anything. Almost any social issue can be handled in a group this size. Right? When you start to scale it up at multiple sites to a whole city, state, nation, the results crumble very quickly. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but we're just starting to try to unpack that. What happens when you take something that works and scale it up, and why is it that it doesn't work? Right? Again, a bit of a down. Let me just end by saying, I think there are solutions to all of these things. There are exciting things happening on all of these fronts that give me a lot of hope for what we all want to happen against these social issues. I think part of the answer is strategy, better strategy, and that's part of what BridgeFan does, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. Part of it is about how you measure results with the two it's in. I think there's a real gap in the market when it comes to measuring in a smart way. And lastly, I can share a real example that I think has been tremendously effective that I worked on. Um, it's the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative. So I'm going to pause there. I want to leave enough time for Q&A, so we can go straight into Q&A. If there's a general consensus that one of these is more interesting than the others, I can say a couple things about this. Or we can end early and go hit the vending machines. <laughs> <laughs> what are the strategies that you use? The strategies that we use? Well, okay. Um, we don't have that. Sorry. I second that. Okay, how many, how many for strategy? Can you go to all of them? Do you want me to go to all of them? Just really good. I will try to go really fast at all of them. How, how many really care about measuring results? We want to hear about the 10,000 working examples, SMEs in the developing world. We have a half hour. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have a half hour. We have a half hour. You have a half hour. Okay, I will try to do like the three minute version of each one of these and then stop and do a little QA in between. Is that good? Yeah. Right. Um, and we can also talk at Brick Oven, aka Heaps Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so when people used to come into town when I was at BYU, we'd all say, oh, that's. That's now called Brick Oven, it was Heaps Pizza. So the fact that I got an email telling me it was called Heaps Pizza on my statement, I'm old. What is strategy? Fundamentally, strategy comes from economics. It's about the, the allocation of scarce resources, right? So let me ask you a question. Pretend you're, you're Mr. or Ms. Uh, nonprofit CEO or executive director. Imagine you've got funding from one source, it's all unrestricted funding. You guys know the difference between restricted and unrestricted funding, right? It's all unrestricted, one source, right? All of a sudden, you get your funding reduced by 10%. <coughs> Not that hypothetical. This is happening, it has been happening over the last 10 years quite a bit. What do you cut? Which of your three program areas do you cut? Which of the services to kids do you cut, right? Say the funding comes back, what do you add? Do you add back what you cut, or is it something else that you want to innovate in? Or add infrastructure? And here's the other question. Would a majority of the people around you, your board and your senior management, give the same answers? Right? When we ask nonprofit CEOs this, they typically break out into hives. Because A, this is actually the kind of thing they're dealing with all the time. And B, there is no consensus about what they should be doing in that situation. And that's typically a symptom of the fact that you don't actually have a strategy, a real strategy. What is a real strategy? Think of it as a GPS. The coordinates you put in to the GPS, your end goal, are what we would call your intended impact. That's made up largely of two things, who you serve 
I'm speaking broadly about human services here, right? You could think of something similar in the environment than in some other cases, right? But who you serve, very clearly, the demographics, the age, the gender, the attributes, the skills, the lack of skills, who are you serving? And second, what outcomes do you want for them? And an outcome, remember, I mean, there are lots of definitions. The one I like the best is it's a change in attitude, skills, knowledge, or behavior. And so what is the outcome you want for those people? That is the touchstone you're going to come back to over and over again. That's your intended impact. Right? Because there are so many different issue areas that nonprofits are covering, you have to state this first or else you can't proceed the strategy. The next question is how do you get there? How do you plot your course there? This is what we call theory of change. How many have heard of that term, theory of change? Okay, it's a bit jargony. These are both a bit jargony, but I'll try to explain what it is. Um, I'll actually explain it on the next page, but it's, it's, it's the series of steps that you think lead to these outcomes. And then lastly, you course correct. You make a wrong turn and your garment will reroute you. You need to have the same facility with your strategy because things are gonna change. I have never seen a business plan last more than about 18 months before you had to do some revision to it. Right? The intended impact will stay, most of the theory of change will stay, but you constantly course correct along the way. To me, those three things are a strategy. Let me say a little bit more about what they, what they mean. So we talked about intended impact. Let me just make it really concrete. It's kids from the age of 18 months to three years who are developmentally behind and will fail in kindergarten within the Provo or an area and who are below 200% of FPL. And that is a statement of your beneficiary. Saying disadvantaged kids is not a statement of who your beneficiary is. You guys get the difference? You have to bound it geographically by age, any, any demographics you can and their current state, right? And then what outcomes do you seek to achieve? I want them reading by third and fourth grade at the appropriate level, right? That's testable. You can give a Dibbles test, you can do whatever, you can measure that. Theory of change um, is essentially a series of logical statements about how you're gonna get them there. So in this example, we're gonna do careful intake, we're gonna pair them with a mentor, we're gonna give them five hours a week, one hour a day of uh, interaction. We're gonna test them periodically every quarter, we're going to give them medical checks, we're going to them, whatever those, that series of things is, <coughs> those are the things you believe have the outcome you're seeking. If you don't state those, you can't measure against them, you can't actually tell if you're having a success, frankly. So laying out that causal chain is what the theory of change is. Does that make sense? So that series of steps, okay. We think this is really important because it allows you to communicate to people what you do in a very clear way. It allows you to measure if you're actually getting it done in a very clear way. It allows you to measure, uh, I'm sorry, it allows you to uh, understand when you need to source for it. So here's an example, Nurse Family Partnership. This is one of the few evidence-based programs in the United States. So when a mom who's isolated or disadvantaged in some way, often an immigrant, maybe English is a second language, gets pregnant and needs this service, a visiting nurse will come into their home for eight months before pregnancy and then typically two years after the baby is born. And this has been shown to have incredible changes in the life trajectory of the baby. To the, to the degree that incarceration rates 17 years later will actually be lower because a visiting nurse came for those eight months and two years after. That's pretty amazing, that's pretty rare to see that kind of longevity of the results, right? So here are just the statements of their intended impact <coughs> and theory of change. I'll just skim those. Okay, so that was my quick two minutes on strategy. Does this make sense? Have you, have you seen something like this in the nonprofits you work with or in government programs? No, I haven't seen some of those. That's bad. You should go and harangue those people. <laughs> Tell them they need to get PowerPoint and start making boxes that are linked together with lines. <laughs> answer this question, right? What are the inputs? What kind of people come in? What resources? What services do you deliver? And what are the outcomes you're trying to create? So some of those outcomes will be intermediate measure along the way that are predictive of the final outcomes. But that's the question you need to be able to answer. So with this, how do you improve accountability? Do you, from your perspective, ideally you'd want them to hire you, you come in and you can teach them, but like, it seems like there's a lot of research, there's a lot of evidence that these are things that, have, that should be done. And the government, you hear on the news, oh, there's waste here, there's duplication here, or this program isn't effective, but by golly, it sounds good and it gets public support, or this NGO sounds good, or whatever the case is, where is the accountability that actually forces these organizations, whether government or nonprofit, to actually implement these strategies? So 
so it works because it just seems like there's so much money. I mean, there's a lot of good people that donate, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that's just floating around for these good causes. Yeah. But there's a disconnect between the results. Yeah, that's a great question. That's that's basically what I want to talk about in the management part. Because uh, the quick answer is the funders have to demand this level of capital. If that's the only, I mean, that is who, that's who, there are no hard market forces for nonprofits, but funders are the next best thing. So if funders understand evidence-based programs, understand medical preparation, <coughs> understand financial accounting, et cetera, they will demand these things. The problem is, if each of them demands something different than the nonprofit is stuck reporting against 15 things, and that's problematic. We'll talk more about that. What strategies have you seen to get the board of directors, the funders, everyone on page um, so that you can actually create this theory of change, logic model, this sequence of events, and be able to do the measurement? Uh, that's that's the secret sauce of what BridgeNet does. It takes us about six months. The process for doing this part, getting the intended impact theory of change right, is very iterative, often quite messy. Some people will get angry. Some people may even lose it. But um, the way we do it is you kind of interview everyone up front, like all the people who matter in an accountability sense, so the board, senior management, some constituents and participants, maybe some government agencies that have oversight. You get, you know, get in your head, how dispersed is their definition of the intended impact and theory of change right now? And then you need them all in a room to play that back and say, look, you guys are all over the map. You're actually talking about two different nonprofits, and right now the CEO is trying to deliver against both of those. And then you dig into the, the evidence, hopefully there is evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning the research that's been done, and say, this one actually has a bit more evidence that it gets you this outcome, this one gets you something else, right? So you play it back to them, and eventually, by the facilitated well enough, people will start to come around to the same theory of change and intended impact. And if they don't, that's when the CEO and the board have to make hard decisions about do we actually fire the CEO who is not on board with that particular intended impact and theory of change. Um, but it, it's, it's a fairly difficult process <coughs> because people are very emotionally tied to these things. Right? People don't go into the nonprofit sector to make lots of money. They do it because they get this, they feel tied to the issue. And so they have strong feelings about so how do um, how do boards and, and you know the, the executive groups of, of these organizations how do they end up hiring people with this different vision? I mean, wh where's the breakdown? I mean, they they hire these people who are obviously capable, but do I mean? Do it, where, yeah, what, what's it I mean? Do they not say that there's an expectation that this is the goal we're driving for? And, or, or do they just bring them on and say, hey, you're great at what you do, we want you on board, and, and yeah. then the person is able to say, hey, well, I think this is what we ought to do, and then all of a sudden you've got everybody just going yeah. their own way. It's a good question. I think, um, so starting with the board, most boards of nonprofits are fairly underperforming themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think you will find most boards don't actually understand the programming of the nonprofit that they are governing. So start with that as a premise, and it leads to this situation, for one. Number two, even the senior management have different perceptions. What we're talking about can often be very abstract, right? You're talking about social-emotional skills in low-income kids. And so each person is touching, you know, we're all blind men and an elephant in this sense. Each person can bring to that what they think is the secret sauce and what they're doing. And so senior managers can all have a different piece that they think is critical to their program and that colors this discussion, right? Different people will have interacted with the program in different ways. Some will have actually run a site, others will be in finance, and they have different views because of what the data they have are. And so it's, it's a normal human endeavor. You have a slightly different data set trying to answer the question. Layer on top of that, the fact that in communication, <coughs> the time to get the communication right, to clearly articulate your intended impact and theory of change, there's not a lot of time and people don't communicate necessarily perfectly about it, and so that adds to the problem. So when we come in, we have never come into a nonprofit <coughs> with a really clear intended impact and theory of change. And we've left some without a clear one either. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Okay, well, I have two more on this, and I'm going to switch to the next one. Yeah. So once an organization has their core strategy for the theory of change set, how do they stay true to that when, like you mentioned earlier, they have to change the way and yeah. they can mission their Your water bottles the United Nations Foundation? Yeah. They are my client right now. 
Should we switch to <coughs> switch to uh, measurement quickly? Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the 10,000 women program because that's what this is, and in that context, we'll talk about measurements. Okay. How many of you heard of Goldman Sachs? Everybody's favorite company. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, in 2008, think for a moment about 2008. It was happening in the world. How many people liked Goldman Sachs or didn't like Goldman Sachs? So there was someone in Rolling Stone who described them as the blood-sucking vampire squid on the face of humanity. At that point, they contacted us to say, hey, we have this idea, and we need someone to help us understand how to measure it. It was actually a brilliant idea, and this is actually one of the pieces of work I'm most proud of, which is odd, given who the client was. But this initiative has actually been really, really cool for a lot of reasons. So the idea was basically this. Take 10,000 women in the developing world, right? give them tertiary business education, meaning, meaning MBA level business education, to help them be better entrepreneurs. It'll give you empowerment of those women. You can do it through a short course, a certificate program. It's very practical. It's not theoretical. It's not like, like an MBA course here. It's very practical. How do you run the business? Right? Um, and, and they had some questions about it that we helped them to answer. One of the questions was, microfinance is very hot at the time. There's been a little bit of a the shine has come off microfinance since then, right? But at the time it was very hot. And so they were asking themselves, do we do this for leadership reasons? Do we do it with micro enterprises? Do we do it with SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises? They had lots of program models. But what had happened was they hired a former diplomat to go and make this happen. So she made partnerships with everyone in the dog. If you had anything to do with women in the developing world, she 
gave you a ramp, and let you do what you were doing under the umbrella of 10,000 women. We came in and they started asking hard questions about what to measure. So we said, well, what is your theory of change? Because that determines what you measure. They didn't really have one. So we essentially did it for them. And one of the key pieces was this. What do you care about? As Goldman Sachs, what do you care about? What they cared about was broad-based prosperity, the benefit of all. So despite what you may think of them from, from whatever, what they told us is we want real impact. This is not window dressing. But what we want is for there to be a middle class in many of these developing countries who share in the prosperity that we are gaining by doing what we do here. And the way we measure that, we put the words in the mouth, but we said the way you measure that is the revenue of a business and the jobs that it creates. Because formal sector jobs are a much better way to get into the middle class than an informal sector job. You know the distinction I'm talking about here? Okay. So this is selling food on the street versus having a paycheck with a pay stub that goes into a bank. Right? That's a formal sector job. Selling food on the street is informal. So we started doing some research. And what we found was that a micro entrepreneur, they get this bump in income. Right? They're an entrepreneur. They do what they do. An SME, Typically, it's a very different woman in the developing world. This is someone who has higher education of some sort and wants to build a business. They are an entrepreneur of opportunity. They see an opportunity and want to build a business around it. They are not an entrepreneur of necessity, someone who's selling fruit to create an incremental gain in their household income. These SMEs will get you five times the income because you, you've got these formal sector jobs that if they grow enough, they'll throw off, right? So this was a slam dunk. It made much more sense to focus on SMEs rather than micro, micro entrepreneurs, micro clients. Yeah. Are these women, is it mainly international based or is it domestic? Well, so it is now domestic as well. They have a slightly different program called 10,000 Small Businesses, which is for men and women, which I was also a part of. Uh, but the one we're talking about now is all international. And they focus particularly on the groups, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, mm -hmm. and the next 11. So these were countries that they themselves, through their own research, had said we're going to boom. So they were going to try to help women take advantage of that growing economy in these, in these areas. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you grow an SME business in the developing world? Or how do you intervene to help a woman do that? What I thought was particularly smart about this, because we did it, um, was we put together a pipeline of things. So there are lots of business services out there that will give you technical assistance on your business, or they will give you mentoring, or they will do networking or they will give you access to capital, right? We didn't find one that actually strung them all together, and yet that is what everyone told us was necessary for a business to survive and do well. So we went back to Goldman Sachs and said, look, we don't see other people doing this, except in this one case, one of your partners in Nigeria is doing this, and stringing all this together, and it seems to be working really well. They bought it, and so this then became the program model. This became the theory of change that everything would hang on, and they then, very nice way, shoved this model on the throats of all the other partners and said, this is what we're going to do. Right. <coughs> now, here's the theory of change we showed you before, right? But the idea is, you have inputs that are underserved women that want to grow a business. You give them this entrepreneurial program. You introduce them to networks, etc. You give them lots of training, networking, quarterly events, etc. And what you get is improvements in their business knowledge, and you change their business practices. And out the back end, what you want is an increase in revenue and jobs. And the next question was, how do you measure that? What's the right way to measure? So you already know, my point of view is you measure against the theory of change, right? So say hypothetically, you measure against this theory of change, and you say, okay, we've got Patricia who came into the program. She's the right kind of woman. She has the profile, she's already running a business, right? she has the type of education that we know we need, check. With what resources? Okay, we know that she is getting all the resources here, right? We know that she's offered everything. But then here, there's a problem. It turns out the dosage she's getting is actually not complete. So we measure, is she actually making use of these wraparound services like mentoring or like business assistance, technical assistance? It turns out Patricia is not. So then you don't see the intermediate outcomes, you don't see the final outcomes. If you weren't measuring against all of those things in the theory of change, you wouldn't have known that actually it wasn't an intake problem. She's the right kind of woman. It wasn't a problem with your program model. It's the right program model. What, the problem was the dosage some reason she's not taking advantage of some elements of that pipeline of services. And so then you can go and react to that in a certain way by requiring outreach to Patricia or whatever it may be. Right? So this was, and this sounds simple, this sounds very obvious, right? You measure against each of these things you're doing. 
but typically nonprofits don't. So if Patricia falls out of the program, if you go back and ask someone in the program there, if you ask one of the folks running the program, why did she fall out? Why did she have bad results? We're not really sure. You can't pinpoint what it was that went wrong. So this was another advancement for 10,000 women. They had measurement which helped them at every step of the way know if they were hitting the marks or not, and then could respond to it. And lastly, and then I'll stop on measurement. The, the, this is where I think the cutting edge for nonprofits is. This is something I'm particularly interested in, so I may be overstating it. But right now, most people measure for this reason. They have to comply with funder requirements, right? Or maybe they want some good stories to inspire their staff and inspire their funders. Right? Every once in a while, someone will do a really rigorous impact evaluation. So this is, you all are taking program evaluation right now, right? So someone will do something like that. They'll hire MDRC to come in and do a quasi-experimental design with a control group, maybe random assignments, and that costs many millions of dollars and is often inconclusive. And so the joke is an RCT design is like an autopsy. It's always too late, and it's often inconclusive. <laughs> right? spend a lot of money. What people are not doing is what we would call measurement to help you continuously improve. So in the for-profit sector, what you would be doing is collecting data that help you know what to change on the assembly line, right? Is there a point at which you're getting a lot of defects in your Toyota Camry? There is no corollary for that in the nonprofit sector. So this idea of continuously improving just is, isn't really there, right? People find a program model that seems to work, and they run it, and they raise money around it, and they grow it. And they don't ask the basic question of, are there tweaks we can make to make it more cost effective? Right? Could we up the dosage here or lower it here? They're just not asking that question. So I think here's, here's the last, I'll end on this, and then we'll spend the last little bit in the Q&A. I think, and Richmond has a point of view, that this is what is required. People need to do these four things to do what I just described, to do performance measurement well. So notice, I'm not calling this evaluation. I'm not calling it program evaluation, because it's not trying to set up causality or attribution, right? There's no control group necessarily, <coughs> although you can do that too. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is continuous improvement, just using data to make it <coughs> better. You start by defining what you're trying to do. Intended impact, theory of change, what we just talked through, right? Then you measure, you collect the data, and you validate that data. By validating, I mean you have someone else go back and call that same participant and say, hey, I know we have the survey from you, is this right? So you know the degree to which your data is coming in clean or not. So you validate that data, you get the reports, you analyze it, and you learn from it, right? So I think these two things are things that you all, these are in the wheelhouse for you guys, right? This is the MPA program. You measure, you analyze. Then you have to make decisions about what to improve. You have to feed this back into the program model itself in some way and communicate those changes. Here's my hypothesis, and this is where I'll end. People don't do this. They don't define particularly well. So the stuff they measure may or may not be right. The analysis may be great, but it may not be getting what you need because you haven't defined clearly enough. And even if you got good stuff out of it, in nonprofits, the skill set that it takes to take data, look at it, think about what matters for your strategy, and then make changes to the program, that loop doesn't happen. It's a combination of the lack of skills to do it. I think you all have those skills and it's the lack of time to be able to do those things because of the funding pressure. So I guess I would leave you with that question. As you move off into government or nonprofits, how clearly can you define what you're trying to get done in a program, right? Then you, met, you collect the data, you measure, you learn, and how much can you, how much improvement can you drive with that data? Those are the two things that are missing, and that's what I think you can add to the agencies, to the nonprofits, the organizations where you work. So I'll just, I'll just end there. Ten minutes, questions for this or anything else. Yeah. And so the whole approach you have is very data focused. Yeah. And there's a lot of advantages to that. But what do you think about many organizations feel they focus too much on the on the data, they move their vision, they lose their connection with their customer. Yeah. And so how do you account for that? that that's a great question. I'm hoping I can find them. there's a great slide here in my measurement. <coughs> I have a statement by a measurement director, which I think is great on this. The basic answer is, I think I cut it out. Um, if you really care about the people you're serving, 
going to lapse into Mormon speak for a moment. Why do you collect home teaching statistics? Because you actually care about the individuals who are being home taught. It's the same, same thing here, right? If, if you collect data from people and actually act on it in a way that makes their lives better, that is showing more respect for those people than telling a nice story about the two people who actually benefited from the program, right? Changing the program so everyone benefits is much more respectful to those beneficiaries than letting just a few stars benefit from it. Um, now, I should say something very clearly. What we just talked about is a management strategy. It's not a communication strategy. So you use this data from a management perspective, but you talk about things very differently to the outside world. Because a lot of the outside world will care about the stories a lot more than the data. But you as a manager ought to be on the data. Does that make sense? So what do you do when you encounter resistance to measuring things really well? I mean, sometimes people think, oh, we painted a school, isn't that wonderful, isn't that measurement enough? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do about that? I, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going out and doing something good. I think what I would ask, I would ask some pointed questions. Is the point of this program to let volunteers have a good experience? Is it to improve the grades of kids? Is it to help foster leadership among the Eagle Scouts who put on the project, right? Because there's a legitimate answer in there that's, that it's about the volunteers or about the leadership experience. That's fine. But I think you ask questions to people to say, which one are you actually trying to get out of this? Because it does some and not others. If what you want is grades to go up in school, that is a very different thing. And you can point you in the direction of something that does that. But that's, that's the intended impact conversation you have. Yeah, so this is, this is a great question. So remember, I told the story about Paul Schmitz, who said, I talked to all these people, and they all have great results, and yet the needle's not moving in Milwaukee. Right? The answer to his question, and, and I believe this too, the answer is not to scale up individual nonprofits necessarily, but to link, I think you made this point, to link government systems, so public health systems, public schools, with the researchers and academics, the funders, and the nonprofits who are touching those people, and actually get them synced up. Essentially to do a theory of change at the level of a city around one intended impact statements. Right? So that requires you know, businesses as funders to be on board. It requires government to be on board. It requires the nonprofits to be on board. And, and the interesting thing about that model, I will call that the collective impact model. Have you, have you all heard that term? Our competitors, FSG, coined this term collective impact. But I think it's brilliant. And we've done some work in that too. But what you're doing in collective impact is creating a joint theory of change with a group, and then the resources they already have get slotted into that theory of change. So it doesn't cost a whole lot more except for kind of the coffee and donuts money to get people together to create that vision. <coughs> but it can be very, it can have great impact. Because I mean, think if you've got the public school district to behave a little bit differently. This is the example in Milwaukee. They were trying to solve teen pregnancy. They had a curriculum that had already been approved to teach sex education. Right, but it was not being implemented for a bunch of reasons. By having the school district <coughs> at the party at this collaborative, they were able to get that curriculum taught that reduced teen pregnancy by, I can't remember the rate, but it was, it was a significant change because they simply had all these people in the same room. So I, I, think that's, I think that's the way you get around a lot of these funding constraints that we've been talking about is by having all those people in the same room. And to get them in the same room, you need someone who actually speaks a little bit of each of those languages, which is where I think you all can come in. Okay. Last question, is everybody good one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Ask me in 18 months. <laughs> Thank you very much.